Hello. Hey, Oski. Has it started? There we go. It just yeah. showed up for me. I thought you All were right. going to introduce do the introduction. No, it just told it just said started recording because okay. there was a delay. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining. Thank you for watching us uh, for our audience. Today, we're going to give uh, an update on where we're at with uh, the subspace uh, uh, application suite, the front end application suite that we're working on. Um, we're going to talk about the uh, desktop farmer. We're going to talk about some other uh, front end web apps that we've been working on. Um, so, uh, Oskin, if you'd like to go first and update us on what you've been working on. Sure. So, um, we are trying to implement the plotting progress, the initial plotting progress to the desktop application. It's going well. Um, I was dealing with a bug yesterday. It's, I sold it. And currently, we are able to track how many pieces are being plotted uh, in the subspace desktop app. Uh, this functionality is provided from the library. It's a new feature. And I can share my screen if you want. Um, so let's see this one. <clears throat> so this is started to plotting just uh, 10 minutes ago. Um, and in the terminal, right now I haven't uh, introduced this to the front end, but in the Tauri, in the back end of the subspace desktop, we are able to retrieve how many pieces have been plotted so far. And using this information, we can deduce uh, how much percentage of the initial plotting is done. And we can manipulate that page accordingly. Uh, so this is the feature that's being introduced to the library. And right now, Tauri can use it. Uh, and tomorrow, I will make this uh, working in the front end as well. So not only in terminal, but we will see a proper uh, initial plotting progress bar. There is one problem, though, as far as I know from uh, our conversation with Nazar. We don't have a way of knowing how, my, how many total pieces are there in the blockchain. So we don't have an uh, end point to question that. Uh, so I will need that in order to give a percentage of how many pieces is uh, plotted. So after knowing that it will be fully functional, I don't see any obstacles other than that. So yeah, that's all on the subspace desktop side. Any questions? Yeah, for the block uh, for the blockchain size, that is stored in the block header. It's the it's the number of uh, piece indices, uh, piece root indices that we have. So there's a constant number of pieces per per root block, mm -hmm. um, and we can just extrapolate that from the block header. Okay, okay, maybe there's some other detail I don't know, or maybe Nazar was confused. He just told me that right now uh, he said you couldn't uh, derive the total pieces. But if you say so, yeah, I can try to do it. Okay, do you understand yeah. what I'm saying? I was getting yeah. about, about how to calculate that. Mm -hmm. uh, we can access the block header in the desktop app, right? I think so. I never tried, but it should be possible. Yeah, I, I added a branch in the print that started the, the API in this plotting uh, phase, in this plotting screen. And maybe you can use polka.js to query that data from the network. The block header should be easier. Yeah, so if, if you start, so if you go back to the plotting screen, because you're not actually going to show it here, right? You're going to show it in the previous screen during the uh, setup. Yeah, uh, right now it's still a dummy initial progress bar for the pro front end. Uh, right, right now I'm just demonstrating that we are able to access this information from the library Great. so that we can use it. Yeah. 
but but in the actual user interface, it's like back one step in the workflow, the the, the screen mm -hmm. that we're going to yes, be on, yes. right? Yes. Okay, so exactly. when you go to that screen from Subspace JS, you can just query the mm -hmm. um, the block header, the latest block header. You can get yeah. the uh, the root block index, and then mm -hmm. you just multiply that by the number of pieces in a root block, right? And then that's okay. just the total number of pieces expected, right? And then that's what, since everybody's plotting one replica of the blockchain now, then mm -hmm. that's that's what you're plotting against. And that number should change, like it could actually change during the plotting process because every every so often, right, there's another root block that gets archived. Yeah. Okay. Is, that, is that, so uh, Leo, is the, so the the block header is ex, is exposed, right? You can you can you can retrieve every um, every field in the block header in Polkadot.js, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, so it's working on the back end now, completely, mm -hmm. Oskin. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, are you going to be writing the JavaScript code yourself, or are you working with Leo to to do this? Um, I haven't decided yet. So I will see if it will be too easy. I will do it myself. Why bother Leo? But if I stuck there, I will ask Leo help. I, I will ask help from Leo for sure. Okay. So I'd like you to work with Leo on that rather than trying to tackle it yourself. Leo is going to sure. be able to do it much faster. Um, of course. So I'd like to see a release for this with the with the progress bar by Friday. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you did you talk to Justin and learn how to do a release for this? Yes. In GitHub yet? Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. So um, is it possible for you to restart the desktop app so we can start from the beginning screen? Of course. Um, okay. Let me try to not wipe the plot and commitments and see what will happen now. So we just enter a password. And here we select a folder. Right now I'm selecting a manual okay. one. Okay, slow down, slow down, slow down, please stop here. Okay, so you have to tell it where to put the plot. I don't have to because the default test was working. Uh, you you can manually put some other okay. thing if you want to, but okay, so don't, we don't need any change. Okay, so can you go back to what the default was? Let's test you. Okay. Uh, I can't because I don't remember, but I can restart the application if you want. Okay, that's fine. But there's a default path. Yes. Okay. And it's working. Utilized is how much space is used on your hard disk, on your mm -hmm. default drive. Yes. Available is how much is free. Exactly. Allocated, the user is, it appears the user can select that. Mm -hmm. It's one, one gigabyte, but that's not actually correct, right? Because that's the user true. can't select. Okay. So the first thing we need to do is uh, lock that down, right? Because you can't actually allocate that. So I can make this like the above, so there sh shouldn't be a selecting options, right? Exactly. So that should okay. just auto. So so at this point, you should query the block header from subspace JS, mm -hmm. calculate the size, the estimated size of the plot, mm -hmm. and then that number should get deterministically put into allocated and not be selectable. Great. Okay. Got it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Cool. And then you click start plotting. I do. And again, this is just dummy. I haven't uh, imported this functionality to here right at the moment. And okay, so so yeah. at this point, that is where it's going to start plotting on this on the uh, on the back end. And then you're going to be mm -hmm. listening for these uh, events for the plotting progress, and then making the progress bar map to this. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. And then you click next. And I can't. There is some bug. 
Leo, uh, you had some opinions on that. Do you know why it's happening? Because it never happened when I tried on my own. Probably no, I because that's that's some kind of of timeout, and it's all a fake progress. So I don't know if okay. it can be stuck in there. Um, I should also inspect that then. Maybe because of I was clicking the buttons too fast, it never occurred. Mm, I have to restart this. Call pet is this, and I can use it. And then clicking next. Uh, this is just giving any information. Uh, should I click next? Is it okay? Yeah, I thought, um, Diana, I thought that when we were working on this before, that it was possible to see these screens before the plotting was done so that they would have something to read. Is that right? Or did we did we decide to lock this down so you wouldn't see it until plotting was complete? I remember it being until like as plotting was going. Yeah. Yeah. Same. Okay. I can do that. Uh, yeah, so, so as long as this page starts, it it should pop up. Yeah, you should be able to see this info. Um, mm -hmm. And then so you can kind of like have something to do while it's plotting, right? Um, okay. So then you would click next and it would take Here. you to the prep. Yeah, uh, it's the mnemonic function was not uh, working properly before. I'm talking about two to three weeks prior. Uh, now it works. And also I had to redesign this part part because words were, were not fitting into this space. I think it's looking fine. What, what are your opinions? It's fine. Okay. So unless you click here, you cannot proceed, which is fine. I think it's good. And that's all. This is the last information page. Yeah. And then we can click Finish. Then this page appears. OK, so the allocated should be the same. I guess the allocated is just what it was set on the default. So that mm -hmm. should that should follow through. Yeah. OK. And then um, are the farm blocks correct? Right now, yes, uh, because this is just started from scratch and it takes some time to uh, completely plot it. But if I uh, run the node in an offline setting, it starts uh, farming blocks right away and it works so no problem okay. there so as you as you farm like as you actually uh earn, get the blocks it will populate just the blocks yes. that you've yes. farmed great okay all right and what happens when i click the x button does it go to the tray great yeah okay awesome and then when I click quit, does it kill all the backend processes? Uh, for example, this happened. So when you click minimize or, yeah, when you click minimize, it crashes. This was a known bug. I didn't put some time on it. Uh, so this need to, needs to be fixed before the testnet too or we should cancel the option of minimizing. You mean by sending it to the tray, it crashes it. That's what you mean by minimizing. Not not clicking the X, but the this button. Uh, can you see it? Yeah. The, right. Yeah. Oh, OK. So that will that will that will move it to the um, dock. What do you call it to the dock? OK, yeah. so that crashes it. But, but yeah. clicking X and sending it to the tray doesn't crash it. As far as I know, yes, but I haven't been testing it uh, for, I mean, truly. That's strange. Yes. Okay. 
And then what happens uh, after you, when, when you fully close it, like when you, when you go to the tray and you click quit? It... Um, let's try. We don't know. Okay. I guess uh, we'll we see. don't know. No. I believe you don't need to proceed to uh, all the steps, so I can just do it right now. Quit. Fine. No errors. It quitted gracefully. Okay. And then when it restarts, it detects that you have a plot and it skips the plotting process and takes you straight to the to the syncing the node screen. Um, actually, no. It goes to the plotting phase two, but it should be 100% immediately. So it um, it recognizes you, you have commitments and plot, and it starts uh, farming right away. So probably it should be next, next, next. Uh, plotting is 100% completed immediately, then click finish again, and then this uh, screen of how many blocks have been farmed and so on so you actually have to click through again it doesn't just automatically pass through the plotting there is no functionality for that yeah at the moment i i, I maybe can edit that it's just a view rotor maybe we can add some bar variable that marks like this this is already already has processes the plotting phase and just skip that screen to the dashboard should yeah. not be hard shouldn't be hard yeah yeah, yeah because really actually in in my code when you go to the plotting uh, phase i delete all the the local storage right so mm -hmm. um i don't want to go to that screen again Okay. Okay, so let's review uh, what we've got to do here. So the first thing we've got to do is retrieve the root block piece index or the index of the root block from the block header so that we can know how many pieces we're going to plot on the chain or in our, in our, in our plot, right? How many pieces mm -hmm. are in the chain? Everybody's plotting the same size right now. Okay, so that's that's a Leo task, right? That's that's something you can do, Leo, um, to make sure that subspace GS is actually getting that and and expose that. Um, the next thing we need to do is then lock down the selector bar so that you cannot select your plot size. So that's just automatically derived from there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then we need to connect the progress bar to the actual progress of plotting the pieces. And we mm -hmm. need to make it so that you don't have to wait for that to finish before you can click next and start seeing the pop-ups. So you can click through the pop-ups and then you can, you know, you can get your info, get the private key, um, learn about our discord, all that great stuff. Um, okay. So then it will take you to the final screen. Everything should be working there. The problem is that when you minimize it crashes, so that's a bug that we need to, that's, that's definitely a task for you, Oskin, is to figure out why that crashes when it does okay. that. Um, and then when we restart it, then we need to skip through, we need to basically bypass the whole plotting process. So there needs to be a way to know that there is a plot, that it's complete, um, and that there is a, um, and that, that's observed. So I guess what's probably going to happen if you close the application completely and you're offline for some amount of time, you come back online, there's going to be a replotting process, right? Mm -hmm. to, to catch up to whatever has been missing. And that's also going to occur, that, that is occurring in real time as well, right, Oskin? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So when it when it restarts, is it replotting? It's not replotting. 
I guess I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I think maybe we had left that in there so that it would display that it was catching up in the meantime. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's clear from the user interface. Like it looks the same on replotting or like on, um, what's the word? Um, Skin care? Syncing. Well, it's not necessarily sync. That's syncing the node. Node. It's mm -hmm. um, updating the plot basically to reflect the um, the latest from the chain. But it can still solve while it's doing that. Yeah. And depending on the time being offline, uh, this should be like maybe one percent or twenty percent. Yeah. That was a question in my head too when you suggested that. So. Uh, how, where, where we draw the line for. Yeah, yeah, it seems like there should be some threshold where it's, um, if it's less than a certain amount that it just, just let it happen in the background. If it's more than it would be, then you it's would great. really want to notify the user because it's going to, it's going to be a long running process and it's going to, they're going to start spinning up their fan and everything. Yeah. Uh, why can't we just simplify and wait until it replots or updates the plot and then start? I mean, it's more simple for users. It's not maybe like the most efficient way because you can do both, right? Technically, but for users, it will be simpler to understand what's going on. So how would that, how would that look, Search? We just wait on this like screen that plot is updating. And once it's done, we go, we move on with like a next step. So, you so we don't have finished. to calculate whether it is like critical amount or not critical. We just wait until it updates, syncs completely, and then we, we move to the next step. And this should be a separate page that should be only displayed when you are offline than being online again. Well, same page as for plotting. Maybe oh, initial, just... initial plotting page, same page. Okay. Yeah, same page, maybe like uh, another title, like plot is updating or something. Yeah, like initial plotting and like updating plot. I so when you get to up updating plot, it should be at like 98% or something like that. And then just show like five minutes to get to the remaining. 2%. I also have a question. I was a bit confused with this plotting screen. There was a button in the bottom right. It was next and then it was finish. Is it on purpose? Uh, it was an old design. I also think that finished is not a good word for that. Um... But I you think... still, I mean, while it's next, you still cannot click it, right? Because you still need to wait until it finishes plotting. Yeah. 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 So maybe we just disable this button, and once the plotting is done, you can click finish or next. Yeah. Yeah, that should do it. Finished is weird because it's it's going to be a background process. It should continue plotting too, and it, I think it's misguiding. So. I was thinking of replacing that word. Uh, what are your opinions to uh, everyone? Yeah, I will disable the change and just leave next. Never change yeah. to finish, at least. Just, I think that for now yeah. is, is enough. Keep it consistent. Yeah. So it would, it would show up next as clickable but that would just bring up the pop-up and then after you go through the pop-ups, then the next would be subdued and it wouldn't be clickable until the plotting is complete. Yeah. Maybe we can show pop-up after timeout without clicking the button. 
because if I click next, I would expect to go to the next step, but it will show me a pop up instead. So maybe we just keep this next button disabled until plotting is done. But after like maybe five seconds, there will be a pop up. That's a good idea too. Yeah, I, I, I was feel thinking. Like I was tricked, you know. I was thinking in 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 maybe updating the the experience and and just when when the plotting is in progress, showing the model with just uh, two two screens, yeah, two screens, and when you click next, another model uh, just with the. Uh, the key, the account uh, backup, and and split these two things. So showing tips on the on the progress on the plotting progress, and when I click next, uh, the the another model with the account backup, right? That makes so sense. So to start the progress, it showed the yeah. tips. In the meanwhile. Uh, the plug list is finished, the mobile disabled, you click next, you export your account and it goes to the dashboard. Yeah, I think that makes sense. We just got to be careful here. The purpose of this initiative right now is not to design a better UI. It's just to actually get it to work because it doesn't even work yet, right? And get And get it out there and start getting feedback in the wild. Diane is doing an independent initiative, which is designing a better UI. And I think we can continue to iterate on this UI, especially once we get feedback from users. Um, but the most important thing is really just to get something working versus having like the most perfect UI right now. Okay. So let's just um, let's just keep the next for now. We'll just, you click next, it brings up the pop-up, you go through the three pop-ups, next is subdued, you could, and then once plotting is done, you click next, it takes you to the, to the final screen, okay? I agree it's not the best solution, but it's the simplest to get something out the door right now. Okay, so, um, Leo, I'd like you to make this your priority to help to help Oskin with this on all these all these front end parts, um, and I'd like us to get a release out as soon as possible, um, ideally by the end of this week. And then Justin, you're going to be responsible for getting this distributed. You know, getting everybody on the team running running one of these, like switching from the from the CLI farmer to to this um, to the desktop farmer as soon as we can get that working. Awesome. I'm sure people will be excited to not have to use terminals anymore. Okay. Any any open questions, Oskin? Not on my side. Yeah. Yeah, I got a question uh, about the about how to handle this. Uh, this long disconnect disconnection time and the replotting of the app. If we are going to distribute it for testing and everything, I think that that, that should be covered. And the easier way should be if, if the plot already exists, just go to the dashboard. And in the dashboard, we can add maybe a, an indicator that a the the node is is syncing or or replotting. Something really simple, not an extra screen, not anything, just an indicator in the dashboard. Well, that's what that's what Serge was saying. Like when we go to the plotting screen, instead of saying initial plotting, it would say updating plot. So okay. it would just it would just the progress bar would kind of be at the stage. You know, it'd be like the the total piece count would change, right? So like the expected plot size will be different. But the plot size should be like 90% or 95%. And then it would just show, okay, well, we've got 5% left. And then you would still be stuck at that screen. Now, the thing we need to do is disable like the pop-ups because yeah. we, we're not going to want to like get them to import their private key and 
all that stuff over again. Um, maybe we have a new yeah. pop-up which just says, hey, your plot is updating. This will take a few minutes or something like that. Um, I and think then once that- can, I think we can get all that information from the APA. So maybe I can get that and, and give it a try. Okay, any other questions, Leo? No, just that. Great. Okay, Diana, let's switch gears. Let you talk about uh, what you've been learning. Thanks, Oskin. Um, yeah, of course. So um, I had conducted 13 personal one-on-one -on -one interviews with users. Um, I asked people to share their screen, forgot about me and just interact with the app. Uh, this way I, I was trying to figure out how people interact with app without work, so, words. So for example, I find out that some, we, we should add some back button and uh, maybe increase the size of prototype because people were, were doing like this. Um, so yeah, uh, I collected all the feedback in the table that I shared uh, with you earlier in the chat. So basically right now we have uh, two clear groups of users. Uh, crypto native people and people who have not used uh, a lot of crypto applications, maybe uh, they are more familiar with um, mobile apps, decentralized, decentralized apps and exchanges, <clears throat> uh, or some people even um, they, they shared with me that they uh, cannot figure out how to how uh, Chia Farmer works, so we just they just gave up with Chia, for example. Um, so yeah, and clear feedback was different for these two groups, uh, but I think that we will will be able to combine both of these groups at least at some point in the next final version of the app. So yeah, I I, I walk you through each screen and uh, give you users feedback on each screen. So it's not individual feedback. Uh, I have all individual feedback and details in the table. So it will be just a general patterns. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you see the screen? So uh, yeah, pretty much everyone were really happy with that screen. Uh, only one feedback that I got from user behavior that we should uh, do prototype or even uh, the application bigger because it's 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 not perfect. Sorry, what do you mean by just the font size being bigger? Uh, yeah, font size bigger because yeah, people just trying to uh, re read their words, read the sentence, and just you know. Uh, they were closer to the screen than usual. Okay. Okay. Um, so the native, the native, the crypto native people were really not happy with with the screen. Uh, basically, uh, the, I got feedback that this is not the way it's done in the crypto world, so I, I would not leave the email. But non-crypto crypto people were really happy with that. So um, um, I got feedback that uh, everyone would leave their email. So that this screen is really controversial right now. <laughs> Did okay. the non-crypto people understand that they could just skip instead of that it wasn't mandatory? Uh, yeah. Or did were they okay with that? Yeah. Or were they, they like even because you're asking for my email, I'm just going to delete this app. So, yeah, uh, crypto native people just would skip this step. Maybe we should like more clear explanation here. Maybe it's not was clear for them. Uh, maybe um, I got feedback that maybe there is other ways to support me. Maybe you should explain it like in there in the order list, why I should uh, leave my email. But 
yeah, I think I got uh, two replies that uh, there is no way that I leave my email. <laughs> but non crypto native people were really happy this 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 screen, definitely. Was that even with them reading the e.g. a community sale? Like, did they realize that that yeah. was the connection for the community sale? Okay. Okay, uh, let's go to the next screen. Um, so, um, I spoke with different people um, and uh, almost all of them uh, wasn't an um, English native people. So I spoke with like, uh, Vietnamese, Hong Kong, Italy, uh, Philippines, so a lot of people, different people from different uh, countries. And um, a lot of them didn't understand the world pledge. Um, so maybe we should think about that. Um, they just like, I, I, I don't understand this world, word, it's just uh, out of my vocabulary right now. Maybe share? Yeah, maybe share. Yeah, definitely. Locate might have some good translations too, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Could we not do some internationalization here where it could just translate this automatically? Yeah, it's possible. I think Tori has support for it as well. Oh, it's UI. Yeah. It's, it's JavaScript. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's JavaScript. Yeah. OK, great. That that will be really nice. Um, yeah, the other feedback that people didn't see uh, options button, options button, I mean, and um, it's here. And this screen is totally failure uh, because no, nobody really understood um, how they should find disk, uh, how they give give up or like pledge uh, five gigabyte, five gigabyte, how it's gonna work. So uh, I should really rework the whole screen here. But um, I get feedback that everyone loves even uh, crypto native people the pre selected disk. So what we uh, would happy to see here is just to like a lot of like analyzing the disk, like all disk on their computer and just like uh, choose some of them to pledge space. Okay, so if I heard you correctly, Diana, you said they really like that it pre-selects and you can just click that, but they would like it, they would like to have the option to select a different disk that was more more clear. Yeah, definitely. So um, they prefer button add more and uh, to see like the list of the disk, all disk, internal, external, and just uh, like click how, how many disks they want to use uh, for a farmer and just uh, start click, uh, start click start button. Well, right now we only support one disk, so they wouldn't be able to select multiple. Oh, okay. You don't know about that? I mean, they could do like a RAID setup, but that's a little bit more advanced from a software perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an advanced feature that's going to be coming out later. Um, okay. And the other thing is, like, they're not going to be able to pledge 90% of free space. It's just going to say, like, how much space that they're going to, like, kind of we were showing with Oskin, um, where it's just like, it, you know, there's not a choice. It's just this is how much you're storing the whole blockchain right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but that will change in the future. So it's probably not worth, like, revising this because maybe by the time this gets out, we'll even support that feature. Mm -hmm. So uh, the next version of the app will be basically the same with the option button, right? Or add more disk button, right? Or we should cut, cut off that uh, functional for now. Well, I think they should have, they can have the ability to choose a different disk. That's mm -hmm. definitely supported. They just don't have the ability to choose multiple disks. So they can't say, well, I want to put it on four disks and maximize my space across these disks. Okay. 
Okay, yeah. got it. Like in my head, the so, options screen should display all of their disks. When they click that, it should pop up with a list of like drive C, B, E, mm -hmm. and they can click one and then hit save and then it switches the disk. But that's just yeah. how I would yeah. expect it. Yeah, that's and exactly the feedback that I got. Uh, for the selection week, we should use, I believe, radio buttons because it's uh, one out of uh, many. So you can select multiple with uh, mm -hmm. radio button selections. We should not use radio buttons, you mean? No, I... I we should I, use a drop-down. Uh, radio buttons are only one selection. Well, we radio is use. like where you have like a list that you can see and you just, you have the little dots next to it and you click one, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah you can have empty multiple. Circles, empty and circles and you click one of them. And uh, if you click another one of them, it disables the pre-selected one. So you can only select one of them out of many mm -hmm. options. Usually, yes, but you can have multiple. Yeah, but... It's like uh, checkbox. I mean, but usually, yes, it's only one. Because it's usually, yes, it's more traditional to use that, in my opinion. So yes. uh, compared to checkbox, where you can select multiple in radio buttons, it's more usual to select only one. Yeah, but if it's a drop down, it's like absolutely clear, clear yeah. that you can only select one. True. True. I didn't think of dropbox. I only think about checkbox and radio buttons. Yeah, I think if uh, radio buttons, it will be easier to choose between disk because we can uh, show how many space they have on the exact disk. Um, with, drop with drop downs, it will be more clear that there is only one, but we can actually show how many disk, how many space it has right now. We can. You can include that in the drop down. Mm. Okay. You mentioned that people had issues seeing the options button too. Uh, yeah, it's just not really uh, bright, I guess. So uh, some people just didn't see it. Maybe we could do like a like some kind of accent purple, like a lighter violet of the purple in the button. I don't know. Just yeah. An idea. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And it should should uh, it shouldn't be options. It should be like cho choose another one or uh, in the Maybe future add, add more. Yeah, because options is not it's not a clear word for many people. Okay, um, should we go to the next screen? Sure. So next screen is dashboard. Uh, so a lot of people didn't get that sync and farming are so uh, they just ask about maybe question mark with some explanation uh, what it means. Uh, I, I get it a lot, even from our ambassadors. Um, some people didn't get that this is a final screen with dashboard. Two people uh, they just like what what should I do next? It's not clear so. Uh, maybe we should explain that too, that this is your like home dashboard, uh, something like that. Maybe maybe we reward the screen somehow. Um, yeah, clearly we need, we need to explain what is um, CCS as uh, subspace coin, because it's just a, like uh, letters and uh, I, I get a lot of questions about it. One way yeah. to indicate that this will be a final page uh, without uh, further inserting more text into explanations would be to use a head heading, in my opinion. So a very bad suggestion, but just hear me out. Like what, if it had said congratulations on the top of the screen as a heading, it, mm -hmm. we would know that there is nothing more to do. Just an example. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's uh, the way one one way to do that, definitely. Um, 
I've got a question. If Dana, can you back up one screen again to the plotting? Pledge space. Okay. So when I click start earning rewards, does it just immediately take me to the next screen? Yes. Okay. And there's no, is there any kind of indication or feedback to the user of the plotting is going on or that when the plotting is complete or anything like that here, or do they just assume that they're going to start earning rewards immediately? Um, yeah. So, um, in the future, in more complicated prototype, it will be a uh, process with sync as there will be some processes farming. So it's not, will be green, uh, instantly. It will be like maybe red when yellow, when green, and they got that feedback too, but yeah, it's just not perfect prototype right now. Okay. So this is not actually an interactive prototype. This is just a prototype of like, okay, fast forward 12 hours. This is what it looks like after you click that button, but that's not the real user experience. In that perspective, it's not, not. I see. Okay. Well, that, I mean, that makes sense why people would be confused. Cause you're just like, you know, it's not like you just get mm -hmm. here, actually. You, there's like something something happening in between, some feedback that they're getting. Is that yeah. is that not something we can simulate in um, in Figma? Uh, yeah, I should figure it out it. It doesn't like animations very much. Yeah, there is a, a different tools for animation, uh, but yeah, in Figma, there is no option to animate it. Maybe there is some, uh, you know, uh, different ways to do that on Figma, but yeah, it's it's not clear right now. Okay, I guess I, I always thought that you could do. I mean, I've seen people build animations with Figma before. I don't know how you do it, but um, okay. So, okay, so that's a bit of a challenge here when we're getting user feedback, when they're not actually, you know, it's like we're giving them user feedback on like wireframes, but not actually like an application. Um, and so it's a little bit, it's a little bit hard to gauge that, right? Yeah, but I think it's still valid, of course. I think everything up to this point is valid, but here it's like, I mean, I can understand why they're confused when that when it just jumps up like to this right away, because there should be some like intermediate progress feedback, like notifications they're getting, like it shouldn't just happen instantly. So, um, okay, is it not? I mean, can we at least like snapshot, like I don't know, like start of sync, like complete of sync, or like sync is almost done. Mm -hmm. um, then we get to the home. So like maybe three versions of this screen, you know, where they kind of see like, you know, and then there's like a little pop that says like, wait six hours or something like that, just to give them a little bit better. It's like a storyboard almost of like, okay, this, this happens next. Right. Two hours later kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, definitely. And I think we should, we, we still need to explain what's going on with uh, synchronization and farming at some point because farming yeah. is different for for subspace and farming in crypto it's uh, it, it's slightly different so we should explain it more and by sync do you mean plotting uh, by, by sync uh, um, I explained it to people that this is a process of connection to the network and uh, Maybe it's not uh, the right definition, but they just, oh, OK, I got it. That's, that's simpler if you can just change that to connection or co co connecting world. But yeah. Yeah, I think connecting is a better word. Um, so then is farming plotting? Farming plotting, sorry. So I guess what I'm asking is like, where do you see the plotting progress or or is that just not not part of the screen? Yeah, I, I'm, I don't wanna use the plotting word because it's not clear even for, for almost everyone. 
Um, so, yeah, maybe there is, will be farming. Um, yeah, yeah, we should re reward this part with farming. So right now it's farming on basically because it's green, but maybe it will be like preparing for farming or something like that. I would argue that it might be better to try and educate the user on the word. We just have a hint, like at the beginning, plotting is the process of downloading and, and verifying the chain history or something along those lines. I don't know, but uh, I agree with Justin. And also I think farming is more vague than plotting. Plotting is more familiar to everybody, I guess, I think. Well, it's hard to say now. <laughs> we should ask people about it. Yeah, definitely. I think is plotting is like too technical. Maybe we should use some phrases like Windows does, like we are setting up things in the backend, something like that. We are preparing or mm -hmm. not, like, not something like plotting itself, like more like setting up, preparing, loading. Configuring, yeah. installing, yeah. something like that. Yeah, We're setting up the yeah. things, something I'm maybe decentralizing the blockchain. Dot dot dot. <laughs> yeah, I know that we all want to educate people, but actually, I think for this app, it's uh, like the simple the, the better. You know, what if it was like connecting? And then like loading the blockchain, like connecting to mm -hmm. chain, connecting to network maybe, and then like loading the blockchain was like the plotting and then like mm -hmm. earning rewards or like farm, but was the farming. And then each one of those, you would like learn more and then you would click and there would be like a pop-up and it would say like, you know, this is plotting basically like more of an education thing, but they don't have mm -hmm. to know that to just to kind of understand what the UI is doing. That's just like if they really want to know what's happening under the hood. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great idea. You like uh, loading part? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and um, our Cryptonated people didn't understand how they start farming without an wallet, without uh, without an account, basically. So, uh, but, but after explanation, uh, they all were fine with that. Um, so maybe we should just explain it to with a question mark. So actually, the the, uh, the wallet or created already it's uh, it's after process and something like that what was the explanation you gave them um i said that uh your bot was created when farming 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 started so all you need to do right now is just to uh like uh save your uh seed phrase see your recovery phrase and that's it and i say that it, it um you need you don't need uh, your account on the different device. Um, it will be dif different accounts for different devices. So uh, there is no no problem with with, with uh, logging into your wallet with a different on, on a different laptop, for example. Was that something that they asked about, or did you did you just go ahead and preemptively explain that to them? Yeah, I guess Emil asked about it. And um, nobody asked uh, about it except him. OK, I guess one thing that's different here from most pretty much all wallets or crypto applications is they normally have like a mandatory step where you have to accept the seed phrase or accept like like a clear notification about the private key or the wallet and here we're just kind of making it optional for them to to go in and 
and see that. Yeah, and it's also happening not in the last screen, but on the first screen. So that's that was the confusion here, why it's not on the first screen, basically. Where we where we take the email, you mean? Um, yeah, they are aware that email is like completely different uh, object. So they just ask why I am not creating the crypto wallet, why I leave in my email, and then uh, the question was uh, was why I created the wallet after I started farming. Can you back up to that screen, to that email screen again? Is there not a way we can like put some text in here that says a wallet has been created on your behalf? Mm -hmm. If you would, and like advanced options again or something like that, like like a note here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I, I mean, I'm just, I'm, I know we can do that. I guess I'm just thinking, like, I'm just asking for feedback if that, if you guys think that would be more confusing or less confusing here. Can you repeat, Jeremiah? Yeah. So I get for what I'm hearing Diana say is that crypto native users, when they, when they come into the screen, they're expecting that they should have a wallet. Like the first step should be create a wallet. And the, the non-crypto native users, they're fine with that. They're like, they don't even know that that's something they're supposed to do. So they're like, yeah, I'll happily give my email. But the crypto native people are like, hold on, what? where's my wallet? And then they get to the end and they're like, oh, here's my wallet. But that should have been at the beginning. So I guess I'm saying, is there is there a way that we can display that, notify that to the user? Like it's it, it has to be in a way that like, it doesn't confuse the ordinary user um, mm -hmm. as a blocker but there's like a hint or a um i don't want to say a notification but just it's but it's but it would still be obvious to the crypto native user that there that there's a wallet being created um and that they can they can like click to learn more like if they want to um you know recover the secret phase phrase immediately or maybe load a different secret phrase or something like that Yeah, I think so. Uh, a simple sentence of this would be enough, maybe. Like, we are going to create a wallet for you in the background, and later you can use it, something like that. So this wouldn't confuse the first comers, non-crypto people, and also answer the questions of the crypto native people. And there can, there can be a question mark button uh, so they can click and read more if they want to. I don't know, just the first suggestion that came to my mind. Maybe we can add the additional screen uh, between uh, register and pledge space. Like, congratulations, uh, you just created the wallet. Uh, please copy the seed, seed, seed phrase. <laughs> that, that's one way. Yeah, I think that's what, I mean, that's Maybe how we had it before. And we we thought we didn't want to do that because that was a confusing step for the non crypto native people. Yeah. Maybe we can provide options like start with a wallet, start with email, like you know, like like on different ways to log in on the web applications, like with Gmail, GitHub, whatever. And here, similar way, you have options. How do you want to proceed? And then you can update like your email, your seed phrase. I've kind of noticed that as like a new emerging standard. Like that's how the sandbox is. You can sign up with your Gmail, you can sign in with MetaMask, or you can create a wallet from scratch. Um, so like you kind of have as Web 2 or as Web 3 as you want it, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, at this stage, we have to be so we don't want to present the user with too many options. We want to have a default option, which we're really pushing them towards and, but allow them, but not feel like, it's kind of like we want them, we want them to have a choice to go back and do it if they really want to, but we don't want to present them with the choice because the more choices you present the user with, the more confused they get. Um, and like, this is the sort of initial barrier we've got to break on this first screen here. For new users so we don't we really don't want to confuse people here or like give them some sort of 
uh, paralysis analysis problem. Um, but we uh, already have two choices, in fact. Right, but I'm saying we don't want to give them like a, a drop, like a, 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 a even more, right? It's like binary, which is like about the easiest you can get versus like A, B, C, D, you know. Okay, let's let, let let's let's keep going, Dinah. If you want to jump forward, yeah, with the rest of the feedback you got. Uh, yeah, and um. Yeah, I almost finished with dashboard screen. So uh, crypto data people wants just more information uh, about how many rewards they uh, earned, um, how many users right now in the network, uh, how they can stake it. So all of that information uh, like was missing. Um, so they, they just uh, say that, that this screen should be more like rich screen. Um, but non crypto people were really happy with that. They say that, okay, this is all, all I need actually to um, to understand how many rewards I earn. So yeah, another controversial screen. And um, yeah, with uh, rewards, go to Polkadot wallet. Uh, almost all of them say that there should be a way to after saved wallet um so they need to don't need to go every time to a polka dot and just maybe uh pre-select uh their wallet address from previous actions yeah sorry i you lost me on that what, what what's the actual expected behavior here um so go to polka dot wallet i guess that uh you go into a Polkadot wallet and connect your farmer up to your Polkadot wallet, so wallet to wallet connection, right? As I, if, if I understood that correctly. So we're exporting the private keys into the Polkadot wallet so that they can spend the funds from the browser. Right. And view, and yeah. view their balance. Okay. But in the, in the future, when you want to uh, like do a transaction for your farmer, um, transaction rewards for your farmer to your Polkadot wallet, uh, you don't need to do the connection one again. So you can just uh, pre-select your wallet here in, in, on the screen. So you, you don't need to go to the browser and so on. Um, shouldn't we be apprehensive of people reusing wallet identities due to being banned? Or not banned, but blacklisted on the farmer. What do you mean by reusing the wallet identity, Justin? So if you use the same wallet identity on two different farmers or two separate farmers, your that identity will be blacklisted because it's one of the checks for um, one of the potential attacks. Right. Um, so but the reason I'm bringing it up is because almost this exact flow happened. I set Skyler up. He exported his wallet, and then he went to go set up another farmer on another computer. So he imported the wallet that he had exported to his Polkadot one, and then blacklisted both of those farmers. Right. Uh, point I was getting at is maybe it would be better to, instead of connecting to the Polkadot.js wallet, but to actually just send a transaction to the person's personal wallet from the farmer identity wallet. That might be too advanced then, for this call. but Then they have to spend fee each time they have to do a transaction and they should that, that can bother people like it's their own coin set and they want to send their own coin to their own bell uh, their own balance and they have to pay fee for that that can yeah back back to native versus non you know yeah well and there's another solution to that where that can actually work where we can have like a master key that gets created and then there's like a child key which gets used for every different instance of a farmer um so that if you did export that private key every time like there would be like a like every time you set up the plot there would be like a deterministic process where it would generate a new plot basically right. like a new a new derived public key for that plot so that 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 would that wouldn't break it 
Um, and you could still use the same key for like all your different plots to manage like one account as opposed to having like, well, if I have 10 farmers, I need 10 keys. Right. But I hear what you're saying. So there's, so that, and that's a protocol sort of design thing. We've got it, we've got to sort out or we've got to incorporate, but I think that's the better solution to that problem versus like restricting them from not being able to export their wallet or connect a wallet. Definitely. I just don't want to see, I feel like the, the native or newbie users might end up blacklisting themselves. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's totally, totally good point. So I think to, to your point, Diana, mm -hmm. about connect wallet, like that should, that should be something which just shows up on like the very first screen. Like it's a one, it's a one-time operation. And then from then on, like after it's connected, it should just be, um, like view funds or something like that, or like see, see account. And then that would just like load, um, mm -hmm. you know, cause it should be saved in your browser at that point, or it's, I mean, I don't remember exactly how Polkadot.js extension works, but it should be uh, persistent. I believe. Okay. Is that right, Serge, Leo? None. I'm okay. not sure. Sorry, can, can you repeat the last phrase? Uh, yeah, so uh, if I if I export, so if I have a, uh, a seed phrase or a private key that I pull out of here and I load it into Polkadot.js, um, then if I later, like, is that saved in like uh, local storage or something like that, like an encrypted form? By Polkadot.js, or will it, next time that I load this Apple, I need to re-import that private key again in order to access that account on like the Block Explorer. Oh, I don't. I'm not sure Me either. Persistent yeah. in my practice. I, I think it's that. persistent. Yeah. Yeah, it's stored. I just checked. Stored. You don't have to upload every time. Yeah. So we just need to reflect that in the user interface then, Diana. Mm -hmm. I think that goes back to your point of people saying they don't want to have to re-import it over and over again. Okay, yeah, that's that's great. Thank you for that. That's much clearer right now. Yeah, that's basically all I have. Um, all general patterns are here. So next step will be um, start with a new version. Um, based on feedback um, and uh, working from there. Okay. When you say new version, you mean like a updated version, not like a from a blank page new version? Uh, no, it will be updated. It's, uh, yeah, I will be, will be uh, using uh, this stuff that I got here. Okay. Great. All right, thank you very much, Dana. That was really, really informative. Thanks for doing all the interviews on that too. Yeah, no problem. That was really fun. Okay. Um, any other questions, comments for Dana about the desktop farmer experiment? Um, I don't know if you saw Diana, but I shot you um, an article that might help out with animations on Figma. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Okay, let's really give nice. Leo. Okay, thanks, Justin. Let's give uh, Leo just a minute to come back to see if he has any updates on the front end apps. Real quick, um, like I said. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. I was just going to ask. Um, I was unclear if I if you wanted me at this meeting. I thought of last week or so you said that me and Skyler didn't need to be at this one. Um, and then I heard you guys were waiting up on me, so I just was curious. Oh my bad, uh, Skyler. Skyler didn't need to be here. Um, I think with everything going on with the test net, it's probably really important for you to be here since we're going to be rolling out the desktop farmer to users uh, pretty pretty quickly. Perfect. So you're on the same page with what's happening there. Gotcha. Yeah, my mistake for being late this morning. Yeah, I mean, my bad if I was confusing last time. 
I didn't think we were going to be as close to getting desktop farmer ready, but things are moving faster than expected. Gotcha. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah. Okay. Leo, I'll turn it over to you. Do you have any updates on on anything on the on the front end app side? Uh, yeah, for the desktop application, I got a branch where I was adding these uh, rewards, and I realized that we already have another kind of reward, these few rewards. So I am adding both the block rewards and the fees, and joining them in the public count. And also, I was moving uh, the API initialization to uh, another class. So, for example, Osgood now can uh, query the API from any screen, not only in the dashboard. The current version is initializing the, the API and the connect, connecting to the nodes when the dashboard uh, started. And I moved that uh, to another screen. So now you can request uh, data from any, any point of the application. And that will also allow me to add uh, a few things that we are we were talking just now, like for example the the API getting the root block from the API and things like that. So yeah, I was working on that, and as you said, this is my priority. So I will be working on, on this uh, to have this working with us soon. Great. Okay. Any questions for Leo? All right, great. Thanks, Leo. Okay. I think that's it, unless there's anything else we need to cover. Anything else you guys want to discuss? Questions? Great. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. To... Go, go ahead, Serge. Sorry. Yeah, so it's more like a general question about uh, the style guide for all our user-facing applications. I think at some point we have to reach uh, to the stage that we have like consistent style for all our apps, right? For a website, for like Relayer UI, desktop, and uh, yeah. So I wanted to know what's what's our perspective on this. Yeah, so we have when, our when, when do we start? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Start? So yeah, uh we actually have our really simple style guide on Figma. Um yeah, it's I think it's called style style guide, but it's 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 quite simple. Yeah. Um so we definitely uh will continue work on that. So we can agree that from now on, if we start a new application, we're we are using that style guide, right? Yeah, so it's not perfect, but it has uh, fonts, it has colors and uh, some basic forms for UI, like buttons, uh, style of uh, like borders and so on. It's, it's really simple uh, right now. Um, but yeah, we will work on that moving forward. Cool. Thanks. I put that in the chat for you. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, maybe to yeah. to to maybe to to add some some comments. Uh, I think that uh, right now the Relayer app has this Bootstrap for framework with all with. I don't know, maybe an 18% 80, of the Yana style guide. And maybe at some point we should uh, use another framework or maybe create a library that contains all that to be used in different React apps. So maybe at some point we should decide which framework, uh, in which framework we are going to implement all these style guides to have these uh, standardized front ends. Yeah, I think that's that's a good point. Um, I, I think that's probably not the the style guide is good enough uh, for now. We've been using it 
for the most part for new applications there's some legacy apps that obviously have nothing to do with the style guide that's okay as well um and it will get refined and improved over time so i think it's definitely to get enough uh level right now for for where we're at um in terms of the the front end framework um it's a, it's something to put to put out on the roadmap I, I don't think it's a huge huge priority right now it's more about just uh being able to develop quickly and get feedback than like consistency right now um especially for things like the hackathons it's really not important to like follow a style guide you know for these for these uh, or like demo applications that we're building um it's it's really not critical uh, for that it's just more for some of these like core apps that we're doing like the block explorer the desktop application um the relayer like as we get more into meta services those things should follow the style guide for sure yeah for demo applications i would like to have a separate conversation we had some discussions with leo but yeah i think we'll dive into details on next thursday okay okay great well thanks everybody for your time thanks everybody for watching we'll see you guys in two weeks Thanks, everybody.